The city of Williamsburg is one of the US's most historically significant areas. Founded as Middle Plantation in 1632, it was among the first British settlements in North America, and served as the capital of Virginia from 1699 to 1780. Sandwiched between Jamestown and Yorktown, the first successful British American settlement and the final battlefield of the American Revolution, respectively, Williamsburg is part of Virginia's historic triangle. If you're a history enthusiast in Virginia, chances are you've been to this area, where they've got a ton of historic sites, museums, and tourist attractions. The most famous of these is Colonial Williamsburg, a whole section of reconstructed colonial city complete with employees in period clothing and horse-drawn carriages for visitors to ride in. There aren't many better places to be an early American history enthusiast, which is pretty great for me considering I live here, and also convenient since this video is part of Project Homecoming 2. If you've seen the first Project Homecoming, you already know the deal, but basically this is a collab about the places history tubers live or come from. The full playlist is in the description down below. So, without further ado, let's talk about the history of Williamsburg, Virginia. First, some background. Prior to the arrival of the British, the coastal area of what is now Virginia was occupied by the Powhatan Chiefdom, or Powhatan Confederacy, an assembly of tribes under the leadership of a paramount chief, who called their country Senecomica, or densely inhabited land. In the late 16th century, under the leadership of Wahoon Seneca, more commonly known by his regnal name of Powhatan, the chiefdom expanded from six original tribes to encompass around 30, with a total estimated population of 14 to 30,000 by 1600. During this time, the area between the Powhatan and Pamunkey Rivers, which the English would call the James and the York, was divided between two member tribes of the Powhatan chiefdom, the Kiskayak and Paspahe peoples. In 1607, three ships sent by the London-based Virginia Company arrived in Senecomica and established the settlement of Jamestown. The Powhatan peoples were wary of the Jamestown settlers at first, and not without reason. The English were not the first Europeans to arrive on Senecomica's shores, and previous interactions hadn't gone great. Spanish marauders had come in 1561 and kidnapped two children to raise as interpreters, returning one of them along with a group of Jesuit missionaries around a decade later. What the returning man told his people prompted them to destroy the mission and kill all of its inhabitants, save for a young boy, who was later recovered by the Spanish in a retaliatory raid. The Spanish had returned several more times in the subsequent decade to kidnap more people. It's possible that creating a united front against the threat of another Spanish invasion was, in fact, a catalyst for Wahoon Seneca's consolidation of the tribes of Senecomica under his rule. The people who settled at Jamestown were fairly ill-prepared to maintain a long-term settlement by themselves. The Virginia Company was focused on trying to find gold and trading opportunities, and most of the people they'd sent to America were either unskilled laborers or craftsmen, not farmers. On top of this, an unfortunate shipwreck left them with limited food stores. As such, they heavily relied on trade with their Powhatan neighbors for food, which wasn't a great situation to be in when the two groups also regularly got into violent skirmishes. A combination of inconsistent food, brackish water and disease due to the poor location chosen for Jamestown, and attacks by native groups led to an 80% mortality rate in the first decade of the colony's history. And at one point, the settlers came close to outright abandoning the colony. In 1609, the Powhatan and English established peace following a meeting between Captain John Smith and Wahoon Seneca. Unfortunately, Smith is our only source on the events of this meeting, and was also a notorious spinner of tall tales, making it impossible to know for sure how much of this dramatic account is accurate. That said, looking at some of the details with an eye to indigenous Virginian culture suggests that Wahoon Seneca may have adopted Smith as a spiritual son, and thus, from his perspective, incorporated Jamestown into the Powhatan chiefdom as a subordinate member. Regardless, the peaceful relationship seems to have rested entirely on the personal relationship between these two men, as when Smith was forced to return to England following an accidental injury, the arrangement quickly collapsed into war. Although the Powhatan had a significant advantage in numbers during the First Anglo-Powhatan War of 1609-1614, they didn't push this advantage, with the English going on the offensive to capture land and supplies. In 1613, English forces captured Wahoon Seneca's daughter, Marawaka, more commonly known by her childhood nickname of Pocahontas. After a year in captivity, she was baptized into Christianity and married to the Englishman John Rolfe, with this diplomatic marriage serving as an end to the war. Wahoon Seneca likely expected the incorporation of Rolfe into his family to secure a lasting peace, but instead it would pave the way to the destruction of his nation's independence. Jamestown had struggled to stay afloat before this point, but tobacco curing techniques Rolfe probably learned from Matawaka's family allowed for the beginning of English tobacco cultivation in Virginia, 
finally making the colony profitable. With this, new settlers began to pour into the English holdings in Virginia and to expand deeper into Senecomica, sparking two more Anglo-Powhatan wars that would end with the disintegration of the Powhatan chiefdom. The idea of building a fortified English settlement in Kiskaic land was originally floated during the First Anglo-Powhatan War, but it became a reality during the Second Anglo-Powhatan War of 1622 to 1632, along with a palisade across the peninsula. The main settlement was named Middle Plantation for its central position between the James and York Rivers. While it was primarily intended as a line of defense for the older settlements further down the peninsula, Middle Plantation's location proved desirable in other ways too. Unlike the swampy Jamestown, Middle Plantation was built on dry ground, and didn't suffer from the same issues with disease and mosquitoes. Over time, increasing numbers of colonists settled on both sides of the palisade, and the town grew in wealth and prominence, eclipsing the capital of Jamestown. Over the course of the 17th century, the colonist population of Virginia had expanded greatly, mostly through the importation of those who entered temporary contracts of servitude for wealthy landowners on the promise of receiving land of their own once their terms were up. Unfortunately for them, all of coastal Virginia's best land was swallowed up by large landholders in the first half of the century, and peace treaties prevented them from waging wars against the surrounding natives to seize more land. A growing population of landless, discontented men would give rise to Bacon's Rebellion in 1676. Using Middle Plantation as their base of operations, rebels led by Nathaniel Bacon waged a war against Virginia's governor, marching on Jamestown in September and burning most of the city to the ground, including the State House. The rebellion fell apart soon after, when Bacon died of dysentery and British reinforcements crushed the remaining rebels. The rebellion would bring about several major changes in Virginia, including an increase in central power and a shift from indentured servitude to race-based chattel slavery as the colony's main source of labor. Most significant for our story, however, the burning of Jamestown prompted discussions about moving the capital. Middle Plantation had long since eclipsed Jamestown in wealth and prominence, with many politicians having homes there, which were used as temporary meeting places for the General Assembly following the burning of Jamestown. It seemed a natural choice for a new capital, but the Crown wasn't too keen on moving the seat of colonial government away from the coast, and instead ordered that Jamestown be rebuilt and be the metropolis of Virginia as the most ancient and convenient place. Nevertheless, Middle Plantation continued to grow in significance. In 1693, it was determined the most convenient and proper spot for the newly proposed College of William and Mary, the main building of which would be constructed between 1695 and 1699. After another fire in the rebuilt Jamestown State House, it was James Blair and Francis Nicholson, co-founders of the college, who would spearhead a new effort to move the capital to Middle Plantation. Five William and Mary students went before the House of Burgesses to present arguments, written by Blair and Nicholson. On June 7, 1699, the General Assembly passed an act to establish a new capital at Middle Plantation, naming it Williamsburg after the reigning King William III. Although it had a few significant buildings and a number of wealthy residents, Middle Plantation was still quite a rural area in 1699, so creating a capital city there required an extensive public building campaign. Though slow moving at first, Construction efforts ramped up after 1705, when the General Assembly passed a revised version of its 1699 Act to encourage more building. The central horse path was expanded into the 90-foot-wide Duke of Gloucester Street, a central avenue connecting the college to the new Capitol building and the public jail, and lined with shops and taverns. 1715 saw the completion of a new powder magazine, a favorite building of mine, and the enlargement of the Bruton Parish Church, which still operates to this day. Williamsburg saw the first purpose-built theater in the British colonies open in 1718, and the Grand Governor's Palace was finally completed in 1722 after 17 years under construction. The Virginia Gazette, a major primary source for early Virginian history, was also founded in Williamsburg in 1736. From 1725 to 1750, Williamsburg experienced a number of difficulties, including a smallpox epidemic and the destruction of the Capitol building in yet another fire. At this point, some proposed moving the capital yet again, but this suggestion was ultimately dismissed. The choice to maintain Williamsburg as Virginia's capital sparked a boomtown period in the city, as Virginia's wealthiest residents began moving to the capital to attend court or assembly sessions. The city's limits were significantly expanded to accommodate the growing population between 1756 and 1759. While the growth of Williamsburg was driven by the gentry and middle class, not all of the new residents belonged to these groups. Nearly 50% of Williamsburg's population at this time was made up of enslaved African Americans, who worked both as personal servants in wealthy households and as laborers in shops and taverns. In 1760, at the suggestion of one Benjamin Franklin, the Bray School was established as a place to teach enslaved children to read and write. You can find the sign marking the original site of the Bray School in Williamsburg today 
as well as the original building itself, though it's in quite an unusual state right now. The years leading up to the American Revolution saw a great deal of political activity in Williamsburg. Through the 1750s and early 1760s, the Virginia House of Burgesses repeatedly challenged the legality of new British policies in Virginia. In late May of 1765, news reached Virginia of the Stamp Act, which would tax colonists by requiring them to purchase stamps for most pieces of paper circulating in the colonies, ranging from documents to playing cards. This sparked outrage amongst many Virginians, including the political elite in Williamsburg. And within a matter of days, the House of Burgesses passed five resolutions condemning the Stamp Act, written by the newly elected Patrick Henry. Later that year, the stamp distributor appointed for Virginia was accosted by a crowd of unhappy Virginians at the east end of Duke of Gloucester Street, who they pursued to the coffee house, where the governor and most of the council were assembled. The next day, he announced his resignation. In 1774, the Virginia House of Burgesses passed resolutions in support of Boston colonists following the Boston Tea Party, prompting the royally appointed governor, Lord Dunmore, to dissolve the General Assembly. The Burgesses continued to meet outside of the Capitol building, however. On August 1st, they held the first Virginia convention in Duke of Gloucester Street's Raleigh Tavern, where they selected six delegates to attend the First Continental Congress, most famously Patrick Henry and George Washington, but also including some lesser known but still significant figures such as Richard Henry Lee, who would propose the resolution for independence in 1776. Also in 1774, the so-called Liberty Pole, which bore a bucket of tar and a bag of feathers alongside the sign, A Cure for the Refractory, was erected across from Raleigh Tavern, as a warning to loyalists. Though no instances of tarring and feathering occurred in Williamsburg, this was a common practice elsewhere in Virginia and the other colonies during the Revolution. In 1775, Virginia Governor Lord Dunmore ordered the powder to be removed from the Williamsburg magazine, lest it be used for revolution. Unfortunately for him, this gesture only enraged the local populace more, and Dunmore ultimately fled the city out of fear for his life, governing from a ship docked near Norfolk for the rest of his administration. With Virginia's Declaration of Independence in 1776, Patrick Henry was elected as the first independent governor and took up residence in the governor's palace. He was followed in 1779 by Thomas Jefferson, who moved the capital to Richmond out of concern that Williamsburg was too vulnerable. Two years later, British forces under Benedict Arnold burned Richmond to the ground, but nevertheless, the new capital stuck. That same year, the Battle of Yorktown was fought a short distance from Williamsburg. This battle would see a decisive victory by the allied American and French forces against the British, and would be the last major land battle of the Revolutionary War. After the Revolution, Williamsburg significantly declined in prominence, overshadowed by the new capital of Richmond. While other cities grew through the early Republican period, Williamsburg stagnated. The federal census of 1860 showed a population of 1895, almost identical to its 1775 population of 1880. It saw some action during the Civil War as a Confederate fortification and the site of the Battle of Williamsburg, but other than that, mostly just faded into the background of Virginia's history as a sleepy little town. So sleepy, in fact, that in 1912, the Richmond Times-Dispatch ran an editorial saying, Tuesday was election day in Williamsburg, but nobody remembered it. The clerk forgot to wake the electoral board. The electoral board could not arouse itself long enough to have the ballots printed. The candidates forgot they were running. The voters forgot they were alive. This insignificance, however, would have the side effect of leaving much of the colonial-era town well-preserved. While many buildings like the governor's palace and magazine were dismantled or left to decay, many others remained standing, and the relative lack of new construction preserved many building foundations and other remnants. In 1926, the rector of Bruton Parish Church, Reverend W.A.R. Goodwin, reached out to wealthy philanthropist John D. Rockefeller Jr., proposing an initiative to preserve the city's remaining colonial buildings. This modest proposal soon expanded into a massive restoration project, reviving the old colonial capital. Colonial Williamsburg opened its first public exhibition, the Raleigh Tavern, in 1932, and two years later, the hostesses working at the tavern would don period clothing for a visit by President Franklin D. Roosevelt, which would quickly become standard for Colonial Williamsburg staff. Today, Colonial Williamsburg is Virginia's biggest tourist attraction and forms part of the historic triangle along with Jamestown and Yorktown Battlefield. It has continued to develop since its founding, with updated attractions and renovations improving the accuracy of reconstructed buildings in accordance with new scholarship. The modern city around it has also developed and is now home to about 15,000 people and an ungodly number of pancake houses. Thank you for watching, everybody. Virginia history is one of my great loves, so I had a lot of fun with this one. There were also a whole lot of topics I touched on that I'd love to cover in more depth, like Santa Comica, Jamestown, Bacon's Rebellion, and my boy Lord Dunmore. So if you'd like to see videos on those, let me know in the comments. 
And don't forget to like, subscribe, and check out the Project Homecoming 2 playlist in the description down below. You'll also find all of my sources down there. I've been Soma, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.